Kia ora, good morning. He is risen. Welcome to our North Cross Church online service for Resurrection Sunday. It's one of the most important dates in the calendar of the world, but especially in the Christian calendar. So we want to welcome you to this special service. Today, Pastor Andrew is going to be speaking about the resurrection. Uh, really expectant to hear what he has to say on one of the greatest uh, historically verifiable awesome things that have ever happened, uh, the reason for our faith. So we look forward to that. Um, but also we're going to be singing some songs together and um, also stick around to the end we have some updates regarding how we're doing church uh, going forward in this orange traffic light um, but before we do that let's pray together and ask for god's blessing on our service lord we thank you for this beautiful day of uh, the resurrection sunday and what a wonderful day where we get to celebrate really the cornerstone of uh, and of all that we believe in just the, the wonderful work you have done in and sending your son to die for to live a perfect life and die for us and to be raised again and so god we rejoice on this wonderful day and we pray that for our time together may it be special may it be an encouragement to all of us who watch in here and we pray in jesus name amen
Hi everyone, Yvonne likes to surprise us, her family, uh, with um, birthday presents and Christmas presents that we weren't expecting. It makes her day, <laughs> maybe her week, maybe her year, um, to give a present um, that was just totally unexpected. Several times I didn't know I liked something until she gave it to me and then I just uh, knew that this was something I really wanted. It was an unexpected blessing. And I wonder what it was like going back to when Jesus rose from the dead and his followers were in mourning um, for his death and he unexpectedly walked back into their lives. Surprise! <laughs> One minute they're feeling bitterly disappointed 
and disorientated and dejected. All their hopes had died with Jesus. And next minute, all their dreams are exceeded and their lives are changed forever. Now, for weeks, we've been studying the death of Jesus. And uh, I really enjoyed the study, his death on the cross and all that it means. The truth is, though, his crucifixion, as pivotal as it was, um, would have been nothing without the resurrection of Jesus. If he had not risen from the dead, then all the amazing things he achieved would not have been achieved. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there was no gospel, no good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there'd be no Christianity, no churches, no hope uh, for anybody. He'd be just another deceased founder of a religion. Amazingly, despite telling his disciples that he was going to die and after three days raised from the dead, it still came to them as a huge surprise. Nobody, but nobody, not even the, those closest to him, actually expected him to rise again from the dead within those three days. So this morning, we're going to dive into the unexpected and unprecedented resurrection of Jesus. And I think uh, it's a really interesting study. Uh, we'll go to Luke's record of the resurrection because I think it's an absolute, um, uh, yeah, it's absolute gold. The resurrection appearances of Jesus, and uh, we're going to look at one of them. A group of believers is meeting in secret, including uh, ten of the apostles. Judas, of course, is dead, and Thomas isn't there. Um, being Easter, he may have been at the Rebel Sport um, Easter sale. Who knows? But um, not really good, Thomas. But anyway, they're meeting together, at least the 10, perhaps some others, and two more disciples arrive. And they report that they just encountered Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And then this happens. Luke 24, 36 to 43. While they were still talking about this, the possibility that Jesus had risen from the dead and that he had been seen, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost, a bodiless Jesus. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is myself. Touch, and, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Verse 40, when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Why show them hands and feet? To show them the scars that uh, had been made by the nails on the cross. Clearly visible, clearly he has flesh, clearly the scars were made. Um, and while they still did not believe it, that Jesus was physically with them, because of joy and amazement. So it just was so mind-blowing. Uh, it was just too good to be true. They just couldn't take it in. Just like Yvonne surprises when I or receive one. Um, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, in my mind, I see Jesus chewing this food, chewing this fish uh, with his mouth closed, and all the disciples watching him with their mouths open, totally gobsmacked that, wow, he can be touched, he can, uh, we can see him, uh, there are the scars, and he's even eating food. He is alive and well. Jesus is before them. Nobody expected the resurrection of Jesus, and some would argue that's partly because the Old Testament has virtually nothing to say about rising from the dead. It says lots of things about existence, beyond the grave, but it doesn't talk about bodily existence beyond the grave. That's what is sometimes said. However, there's more evidence that uh, people had some concept of resurrection than is often thought. So we're going to go back there and have a look. I want to give you some examples from the Old Testament of uh, things that could anticipate resurrection in the future. 
First, we'll look at the potential resurrection. Way back in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 22, we have an account of the time that Abraham almost, almost sacrificed his son Isaac on the altar. But before Abraham could kill his son with a, a dagger, God intervenes and provides a ram as a sacrifice. And it, we find out that God had been testing Abraham, testing his obedience to see if he was truly going to follow God, be fully dedicated to God. So what was going through Abraham's mind that he could even consider killing his own child, the child of promise? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, Hebrews 11.9. And that must have been a bodily resurrection, bodily restoration, because Isaac had to carry on uh, from Abraham, uh, and then Isaac had to have a child, um, and so on, for Israel to eventually form and the nation to come from Abraham. So the promises came through Isaac, so he had to be alive bodily. So over 2,000 years before Jesus rose from the dead, there was some sort of notion um, of resurrection and some sort of possibility of resurrection in Abraham's mind. He understood something of it, it seems, the possibility of it. Second, there is a pros the prospect of re resurrection. Now, I have to admit from the start that uh, there's some disagreement over how to interpret what uh, we're going to read now as to what Job says, but uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Job 1925 to 27. Job 1925 to 27. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Now, we can't be pedantic, but if we accept the NIV translation and take it at face value, this text is saying that after Job's skin is destroyed, after uh, he has rotted in the grave, in his flesh, in his body, he will see God. After death, he will see God in his body. That seems to be talking about, in this interpretation of that text, a personal resurrection with a resurrection body. Next we have the prophecy of resurrection. In Ezekiel 37, we have the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, quite a famous vision. And uh, I'm going to read uh, verses 3 to 6 and then verse 10. He, God, this is verse 3, He, God, asked me, Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I, Ezekiel, prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. What an amazing uh, picture uh, we've just sort of heard and seen. The prophet Ezekiel sees a valley of bones, piles of bones, lifeless, dry, skeletal remains. This is a prophecy about Israel. The nation has been banished to Babylon for their sins and they've been living in exile for some time. The prophecy reveals what's in store for Israel in the future. Opinions differ as to what it means. For example, um, some think uh, that this pictures a not too distant uh, restoration of Israel back from Babylon into uh, Israel again. So from the place of the valley of death into a place of life and with God and back in uh, 
the, you know, the land of Israel again. So that's how some see it. Others see it, no, not so much as just in the near future, but way off in the distant future as the spiritual restoration of Israel and the turning back of Israel to God in, in at some future time. These and other suggestions, whichever one is true, um, and we don't have the time to go through them all, God uses the imagery of resurrection to, to sort of portray what he's trying to say about Israel. So in Ezekiel's mind, um, even though he's not you know, thinking of someone's personal resurrection, there is some concept of resurrection there. And in the minds of the people that read it, there's some picture there of resurrection long before Jesus rose from the dead. Finally, there are the preceding resurrections, people who came back to life in the Old Testament bodily, like when the widow of Zarephath's son uh, came back to life. God, he died and God restored him to life through Elijah. And then there was the Shumanite, uh, the widow's son who died, and God restored him back to life through Elisha. And then thirdly, in 2 Kings 13, we read this, quite a remarkable little miracle, little miracle, but <laughs> quite big miracle. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. So you can see this, they threw, throw it into the tomb and where Elisha is buried. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood on his feet. So the Old Testament, it's an amazing story, but the Old Testament contains miraculous restorations which preceded the resurrection of Jesus. And then, of course, there are the New Testament uh, resurrections, if you like, the restorations of people to life, bodily life, before uh, Jesus' own death and resurrection. So first we have the Old Testament. There is some concept, clearly, of resurrection, bodily restoration back there. It wasn't a completely foreign concept by the time Jesus rose from the, rose from the dead. And even the New Testament in his own ministry, Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, he raised the widow of Nain's son, and most famously, he rose, raised Lazarus from the dead, uh, and him when his body was supposedly already decaying. They were sure that it was putrefying, as it were, um, but when, they, when he was brought out by Jesus, he was restored. So we have the potential resurrection, the prospect of resurrection, the prophecy of resurrection and the preceding resurrections. All of these are images of what will come, sort of foreshadowings, perhaps, of the resurrection. Um, not, not clearly, uh, you know, lots of uh, resurrections in the sense of exactly like Jesus, but things that could easily point to him. So these things should, um, learning this should really strengthen our faith and encourage praise. God is not sort of making up things as he goes along. He has this uh, perfect unfolding plan and it moves relentlessly towards the death and resurrection of Jesus. God's put things in the Bible to prepare people in little ways and sometimes big ways for the coming of Jesus. How sort of reassuring for us and how inspiring um, and and think about it, the Bible is not just some collection of random uh, you know, old documents thrown together, but every story, every prophecy, every image, every teaching, it's all been brought together by God um, to uh, tell that one unfolding story um, that uh, we need to hear. So, uh, you know, that's really inspiring and reassuring that uh, we're, we're believing something that is really thought through and planned and, and given to us in a, in a brilliant, amazing form. But this message is entitled, The Unexpected, Unprecedented Resurrection of Jesus. We've looked at the fact that it's unexpected. Now we're going to look for a moment at the fact that it was unprecedented. Yes, there were preceding 
resurrections. But the resurrection of Jesus, as I hinted at just a couple of minutes ago, is also, uh, it is quite unprecedented. There's nothing quite like that uh, any time before Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus was unique. Never before had anyone raised from the grave to be completely, in a completely transformed and permanently different way. Never before had anyone ever risen to never die again. So we looked already at the beginning at Luke's account of the risen Jesus uh, meeting with his disciples. I want to read you John's account because it adds some information that really is helpful for what we're talking about. John uh, chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, the same encounter that took place um, as we talked about earlier. Verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So this is taking place on Resurrection Sunday uh, in the evening. Uh, Jesus had risen early that morning and now he appears to his disciples in the evening. Now they were hiding because they were afraid that the Jewish authorities who had taken their leader would now be hunting them. They're meeting behind locked doors. Um, and it says doors plural. That means that probably the front door was locked. And then if someone managed to get in there, they're in a room that also has a lock. It's bolted with a heavy bolt to stop people coming in. John supplies the details of the locked doors because he has something he wants to tell us that Luke doesn't. And that's primarily that Jesus actually materializes in front of his disciples. He was locked out, but then he is able to appear in the room with them, to be with them bodily. And he says, Shalom, peace be with you. And just before Peter uh, phones Ghostbusters, Jesus shows them, hey, before you phone, no, uh, look at my hands, look at my side. It can only be me. No one else had, you know, the others may get nailed in the hands and feet, but I, I got the side as, um, as well, you know. So this could only be Jesus standing before them in person. Jesus right there has a body of blood and bone. He can be touched again. He can eat food as we saw, um, but his body has new qualities. He's able to come into a room. In the morning, he raised with, uh, through his grave clothes, and now he's turning up, materializing in a room, in a locked room. Different too was the fact that he was, uh, n wasn't always recognizable to those that saw him, at least not at first. When Mary met the risen Jesus near his tomb, where he'd been buried, she thought he was the gardener. Two disciples walk, walked along with him uh, on the road to Emmaus. They had no idea who he was until he revealed himself. And the Gospel of Mark tells us Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. And then there was the incident where Jesus called out uh, to his, the apostles who were fishing. They were out in the boat and he called out. They looked, they could see him, but they didn't recognize him. He was standing on the shore. A few weeks ago, I went to the dentist and I was just about to leave. Um, I was feeling the pain in my wallet more than I was in my mouth and I heard someone call out my name. I turned around to see who it was and I had no idea who it was I was talking to. They got up and stood in front of me. Now, in my defense, um, his appearance had changed a lot since I'd last seen him 15 years earlier. His hair had jumped ship. Uh, he had a bushy moustache at the stage. He had gained wrinkles and weight. And I know what you're thinking, Jonathan Watts. It's not Jonathan. I see him regularly, not once in every 15 years. But for a moment there, I was highly embarrassed because he could see me, my eyes flicking and trying to figure out who he was. And, he's, and then he said, Look, no, it's, and he gave me his name. Now, in fairness, 
the man had a distinct advantage. Obviously, I haven't changed at all in 15 years, but he had. However, it wasn't the passage of time that caused people not to recognize Jesus. Mary, for example, had seen Jesus on the Friday, and this was now the Sunday that she saw the risen Jesus. So in that short time, uh, she didn't recognize him. And so people say, well, perhaps Mary looked through tear-filled eyes. Uh, perhaps Jesus prevented people, um, distorted in some way, uh, so they, um, either himself or, or them, uh, their sight, so they didn't recognize him first. Perhaps uh, the distance between the disciples uh, on the boat and Jesus on the shore was so great that they just saw, you know, somebody, but it was too far to tell uh, who it was. Um, perhaps all those things are true, and perhaps there's an element of that. However, it's very possible, and perhaps more likely, that Jesus is not recognized because he now has his eternal glorified body. He is if you like, his body is better, perhaps, you know, like, if you like, brighter, stronger than it ever had been before. He had this eternal glorified body. When Paul describes the difference between the bodies Christians have now and the body they will get when they're resurrected, he describes them as being, you know, a continuity with the old, but some differences because of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. And there's a big description there, and, and it shows some of those differences and continuities. Old body becomes this. So, will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body was sown, sorry, the body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. A body, but a spiritual body. And we could discuss that in some detail. So, raised in perishable, raised in glory, raised in power. Maybe, thinking about our bodies, uh, in eternity, our old friends will come up to us and, and sort of look twice at us in eternity with our glorified bodies and go, is that really you? <laughs> and when they say, wow, you look amazing, they'll really mean it. They're not just trying to say it to, to make you feel better. <laughs> and they're not saying, you look amazing uh, for your age. Um, uh, who knows? But you can imagine, um, especially those of us a bit older, you know, bodies without wrinkles and, and you know, all the rest. It, it, it could be quite, quite a difference. So since our bodies uh, are going to be changed, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15, and ours is based on Jesus, then perhaps there was something in this um, resurrected appearance that, made people sort of look twice and didn't even sort of really recognize him at first, perhaps um, because he had been raised imperishable in glory, in power. Having said all this, when his followers did recognize Jesus, when they understood who he really was, they were absolutely overjoyed, absolutely just so happy. In time, that joy just deepened and deepened as they realized because he lives, they would live too. Because he lives, all the promises he'd made, uh, he can now deliver on them. Uh, that he is the risen Lord and he can do as he determines. Um, he can make sure that every promise is fulfilled and they get their eternal glorified bodies. This too should strengthen our faith and encourage praise. We need never doubt that God will deliver on his promises or that he doesn't have the power to do it or anything like that. Jesus is risen and we have a sure hope of following him. He is the first fruits and we shall be resurrected in the future to eternal life uh, 
and we can trust it and believe that. Um, rejoice because he is risen. He is risen indeed. And there's something special we want to do today, and that is take communion on Resurrection Sunday to remember, of course, the death of Jesus. But we want to do it from a resurrection perspective. And so we've talked about the fact that Jesus' resurrected body had scars. And uh, I think those scars remain into eternity. He has them with him, as it were, on him, as it were, for eternity. And though he died for our sins, and in in some very true sense, it's our fault that those scars are there, we will not feel shame and guilt because in eternity, those scars in his resurrected, glorified body are evidence of victory, evidence of uh, the fact that he just loves us, evidence of God's grace. There are They're a badge of honor, if you like, not something to be ashamed of. And we will see them throughout eternity without guilt, just reveling in how God is so good to us, so gracious, so loving. We'll be eternally reminded that God loves us and Jesus, God the Son, lay down his life for us that we might live. And he has no regrets about doing it. So as we take communion today, We can be thankful for our salvation and excited about our resurrection. Because he lives, we can eagerly wait, await his return. So uh, join me in prayer as we prepare for communion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just love these truths we've heard today, that Jesus is risen, he is risen indeed, and that he is at your right hand, Father, and he lives and he has all power And he can deliver on everything he's promised, including our resurrection, the resurrection of anyone who believes in him for eternal life. We just pray that you would bless the elements today, um, the bread and the cup, and those symbols of his death for us, paying the price for us, that we will just be grateful for them. And as we think of the scars in his eternal uh, glorified body, May we think about it and may we remember that this is all picturing his great victory on our behalf. And uh, may we bring glory to him and rejoice in him and praise him and thank him uh, during our time of communion for all that he has done. I pray this in Jesus' name.
Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Thank you for being with us. Um, but before we go, just a few updates regarding the life of our church. First of all, as you know, we are in the orange traffic light setting, which means that as of, I guess, today, this Sunday, we're just con- going to continue with one services, one service on Sundays at 10 o'clock. Uh, if you're going to continue watching online, that's not going to make any difference to you. That will continue to be at 10 o'clock. But one service, not two services, just one service at 10 o'clock and no registration needed, just show up. We're looking forward to seeing you here inside the building next Sunday. But also we have some uh, bittersweet news. Uh, We've heard about the resurrection and because of the resurrection, uh, for us who believe, uh, death is not not the end of the story. It's not the end of our story. Um, Sadly, we have uh, two funerals coming up uh, on the 21st of April. Uh, Alan Ross and Nina Gittos both passed away to be with their Savior. Um, So both funerals, both celebrations of life are going to be on the 21st of April. Uh, Alan Ross's service will be held at North Shore Memorial Park at 235 Schnapper Rock Road in Albany at 10 a.m. And then at 1.30 p.m. here at North Cross uh, will be the memorial service of Nina Gittos. So um, if you knew them or you know their family, we'd love to see you here to, to celebrate their life. Well... That's our service for today. We hope you're blessed. We hope you're encouraged. And we pray that and and hope that you'll live your Christian life this week in, in view of the resurrection and all the hope and joy that that brings. See you later.